thanks so much for coming here after two on a Sunday, on the last day. I appreciate you being here. So today we're going to talk Jupiter. And before we get talking Jupiter, I want you to know why you're going to be staring at my face for 30 minutes. So my name is Keeley. I work at the UC Berkeley Division of Data Sciences. And my background is a little interesting, as Karen alluded to. Before I did data science, I studied cognitive science, a lot of thinking about how people think. And then before that, I trained people on how to educate patients at Planned Parenthood. And I mention that not because I'm going to talk about your birth control options today. I promise none of my demos are going to involve a banana. It's, I want to give context to where I'm coming from. I come at data science from the perspective of an instructor and someone who thinks about understanding and how we can get deeply technical concepts across to the layperson. My data science background is a little shaky. So I like to say, that I was raised by wolves in data science. I learned a little bit here and there. And I want to tell you this mostly because there might be some gaps in my knowledge. And I want to warn you for the Q&A that if you ask in detail about Kubernetes, I am going to smile frigidly and direct you to other resources. But I've done work on natural language processing, on instructional design, and I've had the pleasure to work with all the tools that I'm going to be talking about today. So what is today's talk? Today's talk is going to be about a little bit of the background of what problem Berkeley's trying to solve with data science and how Project Jupiter was a really good fit to do that. What are some of the tools that we integrated into our curriculum? One thing that today's talk isn't going to be about is Jupiter for more complex issues. So I've had conversations with some of you yesterday about how you use Jupiter, your hearing of Jupiter. We're throwing notebooks at everything. And occasionally, we're throwing notebooks places where they aren't the best fit. So there's a really great talk that Joel Gruss gave at last year's JupyterCon. The slides are online. And I recommend checking it out. It does some really good insights into why Jupyter notebooks are not the be all end all. But as they're the next hot thing and spreading so fast, I wanted to visit today what makes Jupyter Notebooks special and how to get the most out of them for accessibility and reproducibility. So UC Berkeley's approach to data science. Go Bears. <laughs> I love this quote from Fernando Perez. Fernando is one of the co-founders of Project Jupyter. He made IPython to solve his own research needs. And he teaches data science for us. So he thinks in a few years, if we walk down the campus and we ask a random student about analyzing and making inferences from data, that will be as natural as using email, Facebook, or a web browser, because data science is becoming part of the educational and intellectual fabric of UC Berkeley. We truly see this as being integral to all of our students. They're all going to work with data at some point, even if they're not making a model from scratch. So what are the problems and obstacles to Berkeley getting there? One of them is we got so dang many programs. So this is our list of domain emphases. We released our data science major for the first time last fall. And everyone must choose a domain to emphasize. And as you can see, there's a lot of them. There's 25, in fact. There's a hidden one. There's urban science. And we're considering philosophy right now. They all have different needs, different specializations, different preferred softwares. How can we address all of these needs in all these different domains? Diversity also comes up in my job. I coordinate the data science modules program, where we make short data science lessons in Jupyter Notebooks for non-data science classes. And that means even if you've been avoiding data science and programming your whole life, we're going to come to you and serve it up to you anyway. So how do we solve those needs of people who actively aren't that interested in programming? And then we have course needs for each of those different domains. They want to train researchers. Berkeley is a research institution. We want to incorporate data science pedagogy. How do we teach well? And we want to use it as a communication tool. When our students go out to interview, how can they get across the results of what they worked on? Another thing we're looking at is accessibility concerns. So we want to make sure that our students are able to access our technology, that they can do data science with the hardware that they have available. Not all of our students can afford a high-end laptop that can run a neural network through a couple of epochs. We want to make sure that they're all using software that's compatible with one another. And we want to make sure that they know why data science is important and why they should care about learning this thing called Python and Anaconda and Pandas and all this zoo of creatures and programs. On our faculties aside, 
We know that different domains want to get into data science, but they got to worry about creating assignments and getting those to their students and teaching with those effectively. So as a cognitive science person, this is a really famous paper. Has anybody heard of the magical number seven plus or minus two? Yeah. So it's an oldie but a goodie, and the theory is that our working memory has a limit. Cognitive load is real. We can only remember about five to nine things in our working memory at a time, and since everything needs to be in your working memory before getting in your long-term memory, that means that I only have so many things that I can teach you in one go. So if I'm thinking about a traditional programming course, how many of you learned how to program in an like, in-person course? Show of hands. Does anyone remember what happened day one? Shout it out. Syllabus? What happened after the syllabus? I think a lot of downloads. Hello world, before you even got to the downloads. What's your terminal? Get your Python on your computer. Get NumPy, get everything you need. Fix the thing because your path variable isn't working. It's this enormous process of just getting set up to learn that takes time and resources and a lot of students will just nope right out of that if they have to go through it. So also with accessibility, the next step is the high demand. This is the first day of Foundations of Data Science at Berkeley last fall. It is in Zellerbach Hall, which is our performance hall. There are 1,600 students enrolled, and not everybody made it in. We see that data science has a huge demand from students. They're signing up for these classes as fast as they can get them. They're writing to us worried that they can't get into these classes. They're hearing all the same buzzwords you are. Machine learning is the future, AI is the future. Throw a neural net out. So, summary, problems. We've got many, many different domains, some of which we haven't even reached out to yet in terms of faculty. All those domains need people of different specialties. They need to work in research and education and communication. Of some of those communicators, they're not that happy about doing it because they really don't like programming, but they love what computational analysis can get them. So how do we get all these separate groups to hashtag coexist? How can we all play in the data sandbox together? And ideally, that data sandbox is one digital platform, because I don't know about you, I don't have time to make separate things for philosophy and psychology and econ. So that's where Jupiter comes in. It solved an enormous amount of our problems. How many people here have used Jupiter before? How many people use Jupiter, they would say, regularly? So a couple times a week. All right. How many people are working on a Jupiter hub? Interesting. OK. So a little background on Project Jupiter. Some of this might be familiar, but this diagram was actually new to me. Part of where Jupiter came from as a name was from Galileo. Galileo published a paper in either 1609 or 10 about the moons of Jupiter and discovering these four Galilean moons. And it was one of the first papers that included the data set along with the write-up. And that's a huge part of reproducibility. So Jupiter was built to increase reproducibility and interactivity, scientific work specifically, came from IPython, and has this really robust, supportive, diverse community of developers who are creating these open tools. This matched really well with a lot of Berkeley's needs. We wanted diversity. We wanted things that were modularized, things that we could plug into different disciplines. So this is the Project Jupiter team. I do want to pull out here that Berkeley is certainly by no means the home of Jupiter. We are very lucky that we have a core node of developers, including Fernando Perez and Chris Holdgraf and Yuvi Panda. Um, and they've been awesome enough to work with us to develop some tools that have served our courses. But Jupiter is everywhere. If you're interested in being involved, you can do so. I'm going to touch specifically on notebooks and the hub. I think most of us are familiar with notebooks. And the hub for Berkeley is what takes us to the next step. So notebook's a document. It's also a web app. It's a kernel as well. Um, it opens up in the browser, and that's great for our students because it means they can do their work on a Chromebook or on one of the library computers as long as they're in the cloud. Backend agnostic formula. 
backend agnostic format. So it doesn't matter if you're running it locally or in the cloud, you're gonna see the same things. Language agnostic, although we like Python because it is a great starter language. If we're thinking about data as a narrative and inviting more people to the table, it's nice to tell people that just read this code out loud and see if you can figure out what's going on. And narrative's a big one for me, again, as a cognitive scientist. We know that stories are sticky. They stick with people, they're memorable. And if we can make our analysis into a story, that means that people are more likely to connect with it and be able to use it in their analysis or their decision making. So Jupyter Notebooks are a beautiful document for that. You can progress linearly, you can interleave in these different images and interactivity points that can tell that story. So this is the full back end of the stack of these modular open tools. Um, you've got your Python running in the package ecosystem, notebook document specification, the server protocol, the kernel, notebook interfaces, awesome notebook. Again, I'm not going over this too much in depth because there's a bunch of wonderful tutorials out there. I've got a bunch of links at the end of this deck. So this notebook document is great, but how do we actually connect people with it? That's where the hub comes in. So a hub is a multi-user server, Jupyter Notebooks, and what makes my life and so many instructors' lives so much easier, you can serve identical computing environments to your students. So it means that if I am trying to get my students to work through an assignment, I am vastly cutting down the number of 2 a.m. discussion board posts that say, well, it worked on my computer, but it's not working on the auto grader. And this isn't true for just students as well. Think if you're working in industry or in tech. You probably have another department or another place within your organization that could benefit from reading through your notebooks and being able to run them. Maybe it's a management team, maybe it's marketing, maybe it's some kind of decision maker or communicator. And having a Jupyter Hub that can serve these identical environments helps facilitate that process and makes your work more accessible, more readable, more usable. So the general architecture we're working with, um, we're using Kubernetes. It's building on top of um, the various cloud vendors. We've used Google, we've used AWS, we've used Azure. It's nice that it's vendor agnostic. So it doesn't matter who's giving the credits as long as we have them. Kubernetes allows the containerization technology to take into play, and we can put Jupyter Hubs on top of that. So with Jupyter Hubs, we've actually got a couple right now. There's some running for the bigger classes that wanted specialized packages in their environments they're serving to students. And then there's one big one that's serving our giant data A class and the data science modules. So what the students are seeing, or the users of a hub are seeing, is something like this. There's a thing called the cloud. It's maybe this hazy morass in their brain. And they know that they're connecting to a thing called Jupyter Hub. So what's in the back of that is environments. Python is one that we're using. We have a couple classes running R as well. And they're seeing an interface. Again, I really like the notebook interface because it's linear, because it's clean and simple. And we're looking into the Jupyter Lab interface a little bit. It is more powerful, which has pluses and minuses. I think it's great for our more advanced students in upper div classes who are gonna be continuing on in data science. For a new student, that notebook interface is not a warm hug because it's hard to hug an interface, but certainly more warm and fuzzy than a whole bunch of tabs open. And then authentication. All of our students have a berkeley.edu email address and ID. That's how they get in. Everyone on campus has access to the main Jupyter Hub by default. Anyone can do their work there if they want to. So our estimated daily users, we've been running the Jupyter Hub a couple years now. We're seeing almost 1,000 active daily users on average, so people that logged in and started a kernel at least once. Um, of the whole student population and staff and faculty as well, we saw almost 5,000 people use Data Hub at least once during the semester. And a little over half of that were using it regularly. So they checked in at least 10 times. In terms of cost, if you're trying to get somebody in your organization to start this up, it hasn't been too bad. So our costs go up and down. It depends on the usage. Each of our students, by default, gets, I think, one gig of RAM. And that tends to be enough for most people. We've bumped it up for some of our more complex classes. So our neuroscience course is working with fMRI data. That gets real big real quick. So they get extra. 
So we're seeing a mean daily cost of $192 and $91. The average cost per realistic user, which is somebody that we're seeing log in multiple times and not just once and leave, is about $2 a day. If you're interested in looking more into hubs, we have a couple of Jupyter Hub distributions. So I highly recommend these. I did Littlest Jupyter Hub a couple weeks ago, and knowing nothing about cloud, knowing nothing about Kubernetes, I was up and running in about 20 minutes. It's a pre-packaged Jupyter Hub that walks you through step by step, and you can even start it using free cloud credits that you might get from a lot of different web servers. Jupyter Hub on Kubernetes is a little bit more robust. It's still a distribution, so it's got some defaults. And you can see it at zero to Jupyter Hub, z2jh.jupyter.org. A lot of documentation, more customizable, definitely more scalable. So we interface with a lot of other tools as well. Um, I want to mention NB Git Puller, Jupyter Books, Binder, and the Data Science Library. NB Git Puller. I love Git. I use Git. I hate teaching Git. This XKCD <laughs> cartoon is right on. Of Git is powerful right up until you're afraid that you're going to run into a merge conflict you can't recover from, and then you start saving files funky places and renaming things 2.0 final exclamation point, exclamation point. So what NB Git Puller does is it assumes that I developed my materials on GitHub as I am want to. It then generates a link where anyone clicking that link will do a git pull just by clicking that will copy all the materials from GitHub to their Jupyter Hub individual server. So all of our students in data eight get all of their notebook homeworks without ever hearing the words git, without ever learning a git lesson. They just click a link and they see it in front of them. So the, link pull, the NB Git Puller link generator looks something like this. You enter your Jupyter Hub URL in the top, um, enter in your repository, and then open the file. And I can actually do a demo right now. So let me ditch my screen sharing. So say I have materials in a GitHub repository. <coughs> say perhaps a repository that I put together for today. I want to get these to a student. I'm going to go to that repository. I'm going to copy the URL. Enter that into my link generator. I'm also going to enter in the address of my hub. So in this case, it is datahub.berkeley.edu. And here's my interact link. This is something I would give to a student on our class website or through email. Once they go to this link, I'm going to see the loading bar pop up. I'm going to a fresh new copy of my materials. And I can now work on my own copy of my Jupyter notebooks in the cloud. Simple as that, really, really handy. So you might also be saying, but I don't have a Berkeley account, I can't access your Jupyter Hub. So that's where Binder comes in. So how many people have used my Binder before? Yeah, my Binder's great if you're working with somebody who doesn't have Jupyter Notebook installed on their computer or who doesn't have access to a Jupyter Hub. It's a great way to get files in an interactive way. So Binder looks very similar to NB Git Puller in terms of the interface. With Binder, you are also pasting in your GitHub repository. You can do a path to a notebook file if you want to open it right to a notebook. And you're going to be able to open an interactive version of that notebook. It is a little bit slower, which I will warn you about. So before I get there, I did skip over Jupyter Books. Jupyter Books is something that we've been using for a lot of our data science classes as the textbook, and it's been really nice. It allows us to take our Jupyter notebooks, put them in readable form, while still allowing for interaction. So here's some of those links. I will show these again at the end, because I want to get to the demo. So here's an example of a Jupyter book. This is our Foundations of Data Science book. And all of the things that you're seeing are Jupyter Notebooks. So say that I'm doing 
my segment on sample comparison. And I want to dig into this thing called deflate gate, which is a pretty decent A-B test. So I can read through the material, see the code cells, see the outputs in the notebooks. I can also click on a binder interact link. That binder interact link is going to start me an interactive Jupyter notebook cell. So it does take some time because all of Binder's resources are donated. But this is something that you can use, that I can use, and you can generate these yourself for any Jupyter notebook in a repository. So just as I'm accustomed to, I can run cells, I can see outputs, I can load data, I can work with data. So that's NB Git Polar and my binder. I do want to also talk about the data science library. This is a Python conference. So for our data science classes, we built a special library. I say we, other people, smarter people who work in data aid. This is built on top of pandas and it's really designed for teaching. So if you have a need to teach data science and you're trying to go this approach of abstracting away the things that can confuse students, turn off students, or just get in the way of learning the really important concepts like regression or control flow. Data science might be a good choice. It's definitely more lightweight, less flexible than pandas, and less powerful, but more readable. So one example, um, Boolean indexing is something that I find difficult to teach in pandas. But with data science, again, readable. I can say I have a table of sports data called NBA. NBA dot where salary are above 100,000. That's going to select and filter my role, rows. So summary, Jupyter Notebooks as narrative, interactive, reproducible, reproducible, and accessible. Hubs and the tools are what gets your notebooks to your audience in an interactive way. And for a full demo, let's go back to the repository that I pulled to my Jupyter Hub. So we talked about this technology, about getting notebooks to students. I also want to talk about the way that we're using tools within notebooks. So this was from a course that I designed. It's actually for an executive education course. So this was higher level management who managed teams of data scientists. And we asked the question, what do those managers need to know about data science to do their job effectively? And I bet some of you who work in data science teams under such managers might have some thoughts on this. But we wanted them to get their hands dirty with the data to really understand what it was like to work in, in data science. So we created a notebook and I can do things like walk them through the idea of a case study. Where does this data come from? I can link out to the data source in the dictionary. I can have them walk through the data and something we use a lot is Jupyter Widgets. I love widgets as an interactive teaching tool because again, we're getting away from the code, we're getting to the meat of it. So for this widget, they were training a linear model and trying to figure out what variables could best predict the number of riders for a bike sharing service on a given day. If they know things about what's the day of the week, is there work that day, what's the weather like? So the widget allows us to generate scatter plots, fit lines, we can get the root mean squared error, we can get the betas for the model, and they can play around with different combinations of variables. Does it get better if we do things like add more variables? Can we predict more accurately if we just look at the casual riders versus people who are actually registered with the service and get a slightly lower fee? So widgets have been essential for us, especially in the modules program where we're trying to get people interested in data. Let's get behind this. Let's see what is the payoff so that we can motivate you to actually sign up for that data science course. The last thing I wanted to touch on is an example of the notebook as a narrative document. This was a research project that one of our students made this past year. This student is not a data science major. They were in molecular and cell biology. And they got really interested in computational methods. And it's an excellent example of them writing through their whole process. They are telling the story of what it was like to import their data, to visualize. In this case, they were looking at cephalopod, I want to say bones, but I also want to say they don't have them. It had to do with archaeology. 
So they're looking for cephalopods. Where were they located? What patterns do we see? And they were able to build up these pretty sophisticated looking maps. I was impressed as somebody who has had to dabble in mapping and found it just nails on chalkboard. And through it all, they're documenting what they were thinking, what assumptions they were making, and why they made the decisions that they did. So a great reproducible science document that somebody can follow along. I, as a teacher, can make sure that they took the lesson away that we intended for them to take. And I, as a peer, can review and see, OK, do I think this analysis is legitimate? Am I seeing any holes? Can I understand what this person's communicating effectively? All right. So I think that's just about it for me. I wanted to open it up for some questions. Uh, it was a great talk. <laughs> very, very interesting and compelling. Um, that level of engagement with data is going to help everybody who has to talk to people, not data people who make decisions. Yeah, hi, I actually have two questions. Um, first is, so there was a talk the other day uh, from about business intelligence applications, and there uh, I was curious about Jupyter Notebooks in that realm, and the general idea was that, well, people in like, like CEO levels and CEO levels are probably less inclined to use those notebooks, and I'd be curious if you feel like that's sort of a trend that you're seeing, maybe especially with students, or if you feel like this is actually at that approachable level at this point. And then I'm also a little bit curious, I feel like with that many students uh, using the systems, they have to be putting it through a lot of stress tests and weird cases, so I'd be interested to know if there's times where this is broken and how you guys have dealt with that. Both good questions. The business community one's an interesting one because I've worked with Haas School of, Education, or School of Business on a couple courses now, and people are really clamoring for this data science context awareness. And they get really excited about the notebooks. They kind of feel like real data scientists. I'm running code. I'm editing code. I could break the internet. Who knows, man? Um, so it's a way for them to be engaged. And we've seen that even on our student research projects, their project partners get really into the idea of the notebook. They like that it's an integrated document. They like that they could interact, even if they're not necessarily interacting. Because um, sometimes we can't use Binder. So one thing about Binder and NB Git Puller is that your materials must be in a public repository. And of course, that's not appropriate if you have proprietary data or confidential data. There are ways to get around that with NB Git Puller if you do some deploy keys and really specific things behind the scenes. But even just getting a PDF of a notebook file or HTML rendering, the people that I've worked with in terms of management and business, have they dig it. Um, your other question, when does the hub break? It actually hasn't broken that often. It's something like a little over 99% uptime. When it has broken, the weirdest one was it was over the course of a weekend. It affected some browsers but not others. It had to do with cookies and people who had or hadn't logged in and restarted a session. And it came after a major Jupyter Hub update. So they went back in the security, so or they reverted to the previous version. It was fine. At worst, um, I think a couple classes gave their students an extra day for their assignments. There was some grousing on online forums, and we all survived. I have uh, two. Two, two questions or two aspects of the same. First of all, this is fabulous. Uh, but the, uh, the two questions are, one, for the students and the instructors, what is the biggest, th biggest hurdle that they've had to overcome? And coupled to that is, what's the number one or two, you know, boy, this is great, but I wish it did X. What's the number one thing on the wish list? Good questions. Um, biggest hurdles to overcome, auto grading. I didn't even touch on that. but. The ability to scale has been dependent on our ability to grade in an automated way. When we've got 1,600 people, we don't necessarily have an army of TAs to be able to follow up with it. Um, so we're still looking for good auto grading solutions. Um, on the student side, letting them know how, how much to see behind the curtain. So right now, there's not 
We've tried different transitions from, we're going to hide everything from you and just show you this beautiful, pristine notebook, to we're going to give you insight into how Git interfaces with Jupyter Hub, interfaces with the notebook server. And I think we're still finding that happy medium of how much should we show into the innards, when do we reveal that to students in their data science career. Um, the thing that we wish for most, I would like it to be easier to merge Jupyter Notebook files on GitHub. They're big old JSONs, and any time that you run a cell that your coding partner hasn't run and then try to squish those two together, it gets real grumpy. <laughs> it's not super fun. I know that there's a couple of things that um, you can pay money for that will try to help you with your merge conflicts, but I want a free one. <laughs> so um, I'm an active member of the society because I volunteer for Pi Ladies. I've actually been to UC Berkeley a number of times for some of your data science courses, like last year, um, in the library. And something that I've found that's really useful to students and to me is when we interact, so students who are at school interact with people who are not at school. Because I have like life to tell them about, and they've got all this you know, teaching that can help me sometimes. Um, do you have any plans to somehow open that up with meetups and stuff to the rest of the community? I know UC Berkeley has a very open ethos. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. Right now, data science is wicked understaffed. Um, we are trying to hire more people. It's challenging in a big old bureaucracy that's proudly been around for 150 years. And that's kind of what's holding us back is because the enthusiasm's there on our side, and we know the enthusiasm's there for a lot of you. We just need to have somebody who can like book a room and order pizza. And that person is harder to find than you would think. Nice. Yeah, our undergraduate students have been huge in this program. They are the tutors and lab assistants and undergraduate TAs for a lot of our big courses. And that's kind of one of the accessibility things, too, is that you're learning from a near peer. You're learning from somebody who learned this not that long ago, and they remember what it's like to not know it. Uh Uh, where do you store large data sets? With pandas or our tables library, um, you can read it in from a URL, which you might know. So there's been personal websites. Honestly, we haven't run into it a lot because for teaching, the data set doesn't necessarily need to be big to be effective as a pedagogical tool. We're starting to run into it now that we're trying to get more people onto the Jupyter Hubs for research, because that can be an issue. So we're exploring those options right now. Are, are you collaborating with other universities or research institutes? And, and if you are, do you, do you see yourself as leading in this area, or you see yourself at the same level? We definitely want to collaborate. We had a wonderful national workshop for data science and in education back in June, where we had, I think, like 70 people from the US and internationally and chatted about how we're all teaching data science. Um, leading, I wouldn't say that we're leading. Berkeley is lucky that we have a lot of resources and we have this Jupyter team that is right there, so we are able to build these, these tools and utilize them in new ways, but from the people that I talk to, there's very different problems from somebody trying to start a data science program or class at a small liberal arts college than us who is cramming people into a performance hall. 